Hi folks, we'll give it just another minute or so as people log in, uh, but welcome. So please stand by. Okay, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. Uh, welcome to today's episode of uh, the latest LF networking webinar. Today we're going to be speaking with some folks from the FIDO community, and the topic is Calico VPP, Kubernetes networking with boosters. Um, before we go into introductions of our speakers, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, attendees will be muted during the presentation. Um, however, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, there is a little Q&A window towards the bottom right of your screen. Feel free to click on that and type in questions at any time during the presentation. Um, our speakers uh, may be answering some of those uh, via type, typed response in that uh, Q&A window, but we are holding some time at the end for open questions. Uh, so just know that if we don't get to your your question uh, during the presentation, we will do our best to address it towards the end. Additionally, uh, a recording of this webinar will be available uh, in the next few days. Anyone who registered for uh, the session will automatically get an email with a link to the recording so you can go back and rewatch it. It'll also be available on YouTube and you can access it from the LF networking uh, website. So uh, without further ado, um, our speakers today are Chris Tompkins and Nathan Scribzak. So I'm gonna hand it over to Nathan to uh, do a quick intro of himself and then he'll uh, hand it over to Chris. Thanks, Jill. So nice to meet you. I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Cisco working uh, in the FD.io project. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a contributor on the Calico VPP integration. And uh, on the personal side, I'm a, biking and a hiking enthusiast here uh, as you can see in the photo and uh, on a personal note I, I have a french accent uh, at least i assume despite the name um and uh, i'll hand it over to chris yeah hi there my name is chris tompkins i'm a developer advocate at tigera uh, i was formerly a calico user uh, at the company i worked for before tigera i um, really enjoyed working with the product so so i joined the team um, I tried to update this slide to make it interesting for people who see me more than once. So today's obsession, I bought a globe and I'm very excited about it. Uh, I'm also never without music. So uh, I'm listening to a band called The Friendly Fires at the moment. Uh, I'm always looking from a technical point of view to learn and share. Uh, so you, you'll see at the end how to get in touch with us, but uh, I love to challenge my knowledge and learn more. Uh, so let's connect. Uh, so. I'm taking the lead on, on the first part of this, just to talk a little bit about what Calico is before we move uh, into VPP specifically. So uh, Project Calico is a network, um, open source networking and network security solution for containers, virtual machines, and host-based workloads. Um, it is developed and maintained by the Project Calico community. It's uh, a great way to implement uh, best practice Kubernetes security across um, public and private cloud, across many kinds of environment. And uh, it offers exceptional performance, uh, proven real world scalability and um, interoperability. It's uh, been running on production uh, clusters for, for many years. So it, it's a you know, reliable production hardened setup and it has full uh, support for Kubernetes network policy. Uh, it has an active in, uh, contributor community, and you might have noticed I left the top uh, left one until last. The reason for that is because uh, it's related to what we'll talk mostly about today, um, about data plane support. So um, Project Calico has uh, three data planes today uh, in, in um, production, re production ready data planes, which are uh, the eBPF data plane, the standard Linux and the Windows data plane. Um, but today we're going to talk about a fourth, which is in tech preview, which is VPP. But before we do, uh, I wanted to, to just talk about a few software um, concepts that are important to understand, which will help the context of the conversation. Uh, the first is modularity. 
So on the right, uh, we've got a diagram that most network engineers will be familiar with, which is the, the ISI model. And you can see that it looks something like a brick wall. And the reason it looks that way is because um, when we build software, uh, if we build in modular blocks using a concept known as modularity, it allows us to uh, keep the abstraction of each of the functionality of each block separate to those above and below it. And that um, makes the software easier to maintain and, and has other benefits. So sometimes this works very well. Um, so if we look at the OSI model, uh, layer one at the bottom in the physical layer is a huge success in terms of being modular in relation to the others. By that, I mean that we don't really think very much about what the physical uh, transport medium of our uh, internet connectivity is. Um, you know, you can uh, use um, uh, fiber or copper or even the air for Wi-Fi. Um, we just don't have to think about it and it has no bearing on the higher layers. Um, so it's a success in the sense that layer one is isolated and entirely modular from, from all the other layers. A failure where the concept applied but it wasn't implemented quite so well is layer three. Um, so again, network engineers will probably know that layer three is where IPv4 is implemented or, or IP is implemented. And you'll know the story of how we are still struggling to move away from IPv4. And that's happening um, because we need to move away from IPv4 due to ex address exhaustion, but it's becoming incredibly hard to do so. And that's because uh, layer three is tightly coupled to the blocks above and below it. So it's not as modular as it should have been. Um, that is to say that layer three has overlap with layer two uh, in the sense of broadcast behavior. It has overlap with layer seven in terms of browser behavior. Uh, it has overlap with layer seven again in terms of name resolution. So basically layer three is not as modular as it should be. So this concept is important, modularity. And the next important concept is um, software coupling. Uh, so we have two bits of example software here. One is a pizza store system. And you can see that between the two parts of the pizza, so uh, pizza store software, you can see that there's a strictly defined software interface. Um, you can think of it as two departments in a business that have to talk to each other through that interface. And by having that strictly defined interface, it makes it very easy for us to fix, troubleshoot, and replace any block of software without affecting those around it. Um, so that's called loose coupling. And on the right, we have tight coupling, which is uh, where the, the two parts of the software stack are basically merged into one. And it's very hard to edit one part of that software without having uh, undesirable effects on the others. Now, so I've gone through those quite quickly because we have more interesting things to talk about, but modularity and coupling are both key software concepts. Now in network devices, uh, what we're seeing in the diagram here on the right-hand side uh, is a single network node. That network node could represent a switch, a router, a um, virtual machine hypervisor, a container host, but at the end of the day, it's a network node. Network nodes tend to have an architecture of a control plane and a data plane. So this is a modular software with a defined um, loosely coupled interface between the modules. Now, the job of the control plane is to, well, actually we'll go into that a little more in a moment, but it's to, to, to get an overview of the, of the network. Um, and the red uh, arrows, represent the actual user traffic by which we talk about emails or cat videos or YouTube uh, content or whatever is passed between the data plane. The control plane doesn't have any direct visibility of the actual network traffic. Instead, it exchanges uh, network state and that's represented by the green arrows. Um, so if we elaborate a little bit more on the role of the control plane, inside the network node, the control plane is responsible for figuring out a high level complex uh, consensus of the network. So that might mean, for example, the consensus of sophisticated routing protocols like BGP or OSPF or ISIS. Um, it is necessarily complex software. Uh, there's a lot going on. And so as a result, it's typically implemented on a general purpose CPU because uh, a general purpose CPU is needed to, um, to be able to, to carry out that, that kind of complex software functionality. Uh, the CPU, in fact, is something a lot dissimilar to what's in what's in your low-end laptop. The data plane, in contrast, is responsible for processing the actual transit traffic that moves through the node. Um, as a result, it has to 
forward an awful lot of traffic um, very fast. And if possible, it should use whatever the harbor acceleration features are of the node. Um, so that depending on, on whether this is an expensive switch, it might be a, a hardware ASIC um, or it might be kernel functionality or, or other uh, software functionality or, or uh, acceleration in the NIC. The data plane's job, since it's designed for just forwarding traffic, its job is to be the simplest possible implementation of the required packet forwarding features. So maybe you have a requirement for crypt cryptography in your data plane. Well, then that's a required feature. So it needs to have the simplest possible implementation. But it could be that your data plane requirement is very, very simple. There's a really good example of this, which um, if I had more time, I'd go into more detail. But MPLS is a great example of this in the sense that IP forwarding um, has a certain amount of necessary complexity um, in terms of variable length subnet masks and so on. But MPLS, which is hugely successful in service provider networks, uh, sidesteps a lot of that functionality and reduces the necessary feature set down to a very, very simple, minimal feature set. And, uh, and as a result, MPLS was hugely successful. So this is a good example of how uh, data planes can be designed for different roles. There's no one right solution. So Calico uh, was designed with a four-tier modular wall from day one. Um, I was really excited when I joined um, the team to, to realize that this, this thinking had been there since day one. And those four tiers were uh, the data model, uh, the Felix calculation graph, the data plane driver, and the data plane. You can kind of think of the top two, the data model and the Felix calculation graph, as being analogous to the control plane of the node and the data plane and the data plane driver as being uh, analogous to the, to the data plane. Now, each of those is loosely coupled to the, the ones above and below it, and uh, they are very modularized. Now, we'll talk in a minute about why, why that benefits us, and then uh, you can probably see where I'm going with this, but VPP is one of the data plane options that we support, and we're able to support um, uh, any data plane that appears that, that offers you know, great features like BPP does. So in the case of Calico's data plane, uh, data plane support, what, what do those four components actually do? Well, the data model um, defines the actual custom resources uh, used to enable Calico. So it's the data structures that allow Calico to do the work that it needs to do. So it lives up in the control plane. Um, the, calc uh, the Felix calculation graph makes the smart decisions um, that of what need to be programmed that, that need to be programmed into the data plane. So we said the data plane offers a certain set of functionality. Well, the Felix calculation graph uh, does the complex um, routing and policy um, calculations and then programs the data plane to make those forwarding decisions. It does that for a data plane driver, which is a simple and minimal driver for programming the data plane. So it's like an abstraction layer between the Felix calculation graph and the data plane itself, and the data plane, which is responsible for actually forwarding the packets. So we'll look at the diagram first of all. Um, this diagram says data path, but you could use it as data plane just the same. Um, in a way, this, this diagram is great because the Calico cat logo uh, actually um, sits in the scenario of, of the control plane. It sits above the various data plane options, but you don't have all three implemented in a single node at a single time. You would only have one. Um, so Linux IP tables is our original data plane, which uh, is uh, performant and very, very uh, well battle tested. Um, the Windows host networking service is our data plane that supports Windows and Linux eBPF data plane uh, is an alternative data plane for Linux that has extra requirements around the kernel version, um, but also offers better performance than RIP tables data plane. Then there's the fourth option, which is VPP, which is not yet shown in, uh, in this diagram because it's in tech preview, um, but we'll, uh, we'll go into what VPP can offer us in a sec. So why do we even have a pluggable data plane? Well, it allows us to reuse the control plane code so 
all that com complicated, sophisticated code that was written for the control plane doesn't need to be torn out and replaced. It can be reused uh, no matter what data plane. It also allows us to keep the data plane code specialized and minimal, so it's easy to audit, easy to test, um, and lightweight. And it allows us to target a particular feature set, and it allows us to uh, future-proof, um, so we're able to, um, to switch orientation and support um, particular data planes that our customers would like us to. It makes both us and our customers agile. So I've already spoiled this slide a bit. Um, I should have remembered it was there, but broadly we, we offer those four data plane choices. So we're, we're pretty much on time. So with that background knowledge, thinking about modularity, um, coupling and uh, data planes and the advantages of supporting multiple data planes, um, let's hear, Nathan can tell us a lot more about uh, VPP, the specific data plane choice. Sure, thanks, Chris. I'll try to switch to the sharing. I think you, you need to stop. Yes, sharing. I think I need to stop, don't I? There we go. You should be able to take control now. Right. OK. That should be sharing. Yes, we see it. That's, OK. Thanks. Um, thanks, Chris. So now let's take a look at how we, so how we can leverage the Calico's archi architecture that Chris described to insert VPP as a data plane for Kubernetes networking. Uh, so first, a, a few words about VPP. It, it has been presented many times in, in many presentations, so I won't spend too much time on it here. But in, sh in short, it's a user space network data plane, which is highly optimized both for packet processing and at the API level as well. It is also easily extensible through plugins, which is something we, we used a lot for the Calico integration. Uh, if you'd like to learn more um, about it, there are, there, are, there are plenty of presentation and resources available there, so, so feel free to, to, to go there. Um, now for the Calico VPP integration, what we do is we, we, we use this modularity that Chris described, and we, we add VPP as a data plane under Calico. So when you deploy Calico VPP on a Kubernetes cluster, you will get one VPP instance on each node that processes the container traffic. It does the routing, of course, but also implements the Kubernetes specific data plane features, such as policies, uh, the service view load balancing, uh, and also potentially going traffic source netting, IPAP, VXLAN, uh, the tunnels, the IPsec tunnels, and so on. So all this logic is done in dedicated plugins that are optimized for the, this use case. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible for users to, to configure, just to switch to flip. So you, need, you only need to pass an interface name that VPP will use as a sublink and a driver for consuming it. Actually, you can even leave the driver and VPP will, will try to, to find a, the best driver for the environment. We also configure VPP in a friendly way for container environment. For instance, we use interrupt mode instead of pull mode so that we don't waste CPU cycle busy looping for, for packets. And in many cases, we support running without huge pages as well uh, to limit the number of provisioning step on the, on the servers. That, that might depend on the, on the driver. But now you might think, why do all this? What are the, the issues that require uh, such performance uh, or, or spe very specific features that the, the regular kernel, uh, Linux kernel can provide? So we'll, we'll describe a few of the ones we were aiming at solving, the, the, so the, the main three. Uh, the first one is internal encryption. So if you want to enable encryption from every node to the other. Second is exposing highly available services in, a, in an easier fashion. And the third one would be network intensive application like VPN or proxies being deployed in, in Kubernetes. So for the first use case, uh, internal encryption, um, the thing is encrypting traffic is usually required at some level for, for compliance and security reason. For example, if you, you want SOC2 compliance or PCI DSS, um, it, it, it's, you, you will require it some sort. And having the infrastructure provide the, this encryption has really nice properties because it, it guarantees that regardless of application evolutions, and also maintenance gets easier because if patches have to be applied or security parameters have to be bumped, 
um, you only have to do it in one place and, uh, and you can separate the concerns between the, the encryption infrastructure and the application. The main issue with that comes from performance as the default Linux implementation usually makes it quite impractical to use in production as it reduces the, the, the throughput enough that you, it, it does not really make sense to, to enable it. But with Calico VP, as we expose optimized implementations, uh, we allow this to, to work at line rate and, and with a manageable CPU usage. So uh, that, that enables us to, to use it in production. And then we also expose both IPsec and WIRA to, to address the, the different requirements application might have. The second use case is, uh, is, we target is HA for services. So Kubernetes aims at providing highly available services that are robust to pod or node failure. But this usually gets quite complex in practice because Kubernetes will often drop all connections going through a node when, when the node dies, even if the target pod still lives. And there is no guarantee that the node will load balance the same way when it restarts because all, all you have to, to synchronize state uh, in, um, uh, in another way. In Calico VPP, as we have our custom implementation for the, the Kubernetes services, we can we chose to expose a maglev um, enabled load balancer, which allows us to keep connections even when the load balancing node dies, uh, that they are only lost when the handler part is lost. And with starting node, we will load balance deterministically without having to, to share state. And services can then be exposed by routing external IPs or service IP directly to the nodes that doesn't require a topology change for ingress and it allows even allows for a simpler to topology. So you just have to ECMP between the nodes to, 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 have it, to, have it work, to have your ingress working. Finally, for the network intensive use case like the VPN proxies uh, or CDN or, or storage, uh, the, the network stack usually becomes quite quickly a, a bottleneck as the, the traditional offloads we have like GSO, GRO, so packet coalescing cannot be leveraged. So application developers can use SRLV to, to get around the performance limitations, but then they have to do the addressing, the scheduling and their own. So they don't get the, the, uh, the benefits on Kubernetes. So what we try to do on that use case is uh, offering a high performance alternative. So still high performance alternative to, to the Linux kernel without breaking the benefits that Kubernetes brings. So we do this in two ways, either providing memory, memory enabled interfaces, MEMIFs that are exposed by VPP, um, two pods to, um, to speed up uh, packet transfer. And we also try want to expose VPP's host stack that, that provide the L4 plus, uh, so layer four implementations of protocols, TCP, UDP, TLS, and, and QUIC uh, to applications. And when we put all these use cases together, it, it starts to look like this. Uh, it gives the following architecture. So here we have three nodes each running VPP. Uh, the ingress load balancing is done in two layers. One is CMP in blue and one maglev in green. And there is an encryption layer between the nodes. But, but showing you the, this, uh, this graph, is, the, the graph gets a bit cumbersome. So I, I'll dive quickly into the detail to, to explain a bit more about it. So let's, uh, let's first dive into the VPP lo logic. So the way it works is we provide an extension to the regular Calico YAML declaration. So the regular Calico agent, Felix still runs as a daemon set uh, on each node. As Chris stated, the, we, we keep the same code, we keep the same mechanism. In addition to that, we add a VPP daemon set. So one VPP instance running on each, uh, in a pod on each Kubernetes node, living along, alongside. And this, this VPP registers itself in the Calico control plane so that the, the, the control plane will program it instead of, of the Linux or the Windows or, or eBPF. Uh, we start VPP with a low footprint configuration. By default, no DPDK, no huge pages, and interrupt mode to, to be as lightweight as possible. And then the, the VPP plugin implementing the Kubernetes logic do the magic and do the actual networking. So now, because VPP is a user space stack, there are several things that will be different between VPP and the, the other data planes. As we can see here on the, on the topology, VPP inserts itself between the, the host and network. It's in red in the, in, the, in the figure. So on startup, it will grab one of the host inter network interface, the one that's specified in the configuration, and consume it with the appropriate uplink driver. 
it then restores the host connectivity by creating a tune interface in the host root network namespace that will and then it replicates the original uplink configuration on that interface. So it restores addresses, routes, so that things behave similarly to from the host endpoint. That's, a, that's really useful, uh, for example, on, on environments where you only have one interface and you are SSHing through that interface on the machine and you still would like to keep your SSH session after VPP has started. Uh, the pods are connected just like the hosts uh, with a tune interface in each of the pods namespace. Um, and the Calico control play is running normally on the host and it configures the data point function VP. Since we are using tune interfaces and not VIF, uh, we also don't need to worry about the layer two in the pods, uh, which is a better match for the Kubernetes networking model. And we also gain a few bytes by, by not having the, the help to add. Um, taking a closer look at the packet flow on uh, Calico VP node, uh, the, the way our application will consume this, um, the application that runs in the pod uses the, the regular socket API to send and receive traffic. Uh, and, and the kernel transport stack then generates the, the corresponding packets and send them to VPP through the tune interface. Uh, and, and then afterwards, VPP forwards these packets to the rest of the network. So the main advantage of this setup is that from the, the application standpoint, it's, it's completely unchanged. And the pod isolation is also still provided by the kernel, which limits the, the security constraints we, we put on, on VPP. So the, the, uh, the way it works is really similar to, to regular uh, Calico. From a higher standpoint, the, the logical architecture will look like this uh, on a node where you deploy Calico VPP. So there are two pods on each node, one running the regular Calico agents, here the, the blue components, if you exclude the, the Kubernetes API, and one running the VPP part here in, in white. That second part consists of two containers, one for the control plane and one for the data plane. So we, we kept them separated because this allows uh, separating the concerns. Uh, so it keeps the VPP lifecycle separated from the agents and that reduces the risk of control plane events impacting the global connectivity. And also you can upgrade both independently if uh, usually data plane upgrades are not that correlated to, to agent, uh, agent bumps. Uh, the, the state of this project is, is currently a, a Calico tech preview uh, and it lives in the, the Calico GitHub organization. We now support most of Calico features, so, so most of what the, the control plane is able to, to tell us. And we're working to get feature parity in the near future, hopefully getting, uh, getting generally available sometime soon. So it's an open source project. If you want to contribute, you can find us on, uh, on GitHub uh, under Project Calico. In the, in, the, in the short term, to, to list a few of the upcoming features, uh, we are focusing on the, the cloud deployments, uh, adding support for operators and public clouds. Actually, operators should be close to being released, uh, easing uh, even more the, the uh, deployment process and supporting um, even more public clouds to, to really allow testing to be uh, quite easy. We are also aiming at adding package interfaces, the, the MEMIF I spoke about earlier, and VPP host stack support should come right after. Uh, on the long term, we are aiming at leveraging those, um, those integrations, so those features in, in complementary solutions like Envoy or NSM, Network Service Mesh, to, to allow to address even more specific use cases and, and speed up those, uh, those specific use cases with the, uh, the optimizations VPP provide. So, this should give an overview of the architecture of the project, the way it works. And I hope it makes the, the overview picture I, shown, uh, I have shown earlier a bit clearer. So now what I propose is diving into the use case we mentioned earlier. So encryption, highly available services and uh, packet intensive applications. And, and seeing the way they integrate with this, how we can leverage them in, in applications and while the, what are really the, the performance improvement they, they allow in terms of, of them. So I'm, I'm going back to internal encryption. Um, so we, as I stated earlier, we, we expose a couple of options. We have support for WireGuard, which is cross compatible with uh, Calico Linux and Calico EBPF. So you could imagine having hybrid clusters talking to each other with WireGuard. We also support IPsec, which is the standard uh, encryption algorithm 
And that's also benefited from the, the most optimization in VPP yet because it, it, was, uh, it was developed uh, a bit earlier. IPsec even comes with an asynchronous mode, uh, which allows to distribute the crypto operations of a single tunnel to all the CPUs or a subset of those CPUs that are assigned to VPP. And this allows to reach a much higher throughput than when doing this operation synchronously on the worker, the, the tunnel, the IPsec tunnel was pinned onto because RSS pins us on a, on a single worker, spreading the operation really allows to, to spin th things up. So we did some benchmarks to, to showcase the, the, the performance that, that this can give on a bare metal cluster. The test we did, uh, I'm going to show, is consists of a simple hyper throughput benchmark between two nodes uh, with traffic being tunneled uh, with different encryption modes, different uh, ways of doing the encryption. So when using WireGuard, which is available, which is the other one being available on the free implementations, the, uh, Linux, CBPF, and VPP, uh, we didn't test Windows yet, but uh, maybe, maybe uh, at some point we, we will. Um, so the kernel implementation reaches 2.6 gigabits on one tunnel, uh, both for um, Linux and VPF. And VPP goes uh, a bit faster at five uh, gigabits. Actually, performance should be a bit better uh, with VPP as we really recently integrated a, a crypto backend optimization for ChatChat20, which is the, the crypto part of, um, of WireGuard. And that gives around 30% on specifically the the encryption part. So it should be a bit better. We'll update the results uh, afterwards. Um, and on IPsec, uh, on the other side, it gives better figure. But this would here only with VPP. Uh, we're reaching 9.5 gigabits in synchronous mode. And asynchronous will give 14.4 on a single tunnel, which is uh, leveraging the multiple calls. We also measured the, the global CPU consumption on both nodes during the test, and VPP doesn't consume sig significantly more CPU to reach that throughput. So this really makes uh, enabling encryption across nodes uh, possible in, in, let's say, production environment and still keeping an acceptable throughput. The second use case we, we are considering is highly available services. So. Um, here we, uh, uh, we took a, a Kubernetes cluster with three nodes, each running some containers. So on the figure, there are, are two services with the with VLC and Nginx running. And let's say we expose those through a service IP that we want to have uh, available outside. So doing ingress and exposing services with regular Kubernetes is a bit hard because doing traditional ECMP between nodes usually kills all the connections on the node failure or when adding deleting nodes. Uh, if we use a dedicated ingress uh, load balancer, it, it can create a single point of failure or, or need some sort of state sharing. But as we have the load balancing code living in, uh, in user space plugin, it allows us to do a bit of magic. And in, th in this case, leverage the, the maglev load balancing algorithm to ease that. Um, just a, a quick recap, if you're not familiar with maglev, it's, uh, it's a stateless load balancing algorithm with some nice properties. It, it, was, um, it, it comes from a paper that was made by, by people at Google. It's, uh, the algorithm is deterministic in that the same flow will always be balanced with the same backend if the state of backend doesn't change. And if we add or delete backends, there is some consistency guarantees that most flow will still be balanced to the same backends. So minimizing the lost or reshuffle connections when, when, events, uh, when rebalancing events happen. And the way it will is, is this work is as follows. We generate a list of buckets in the middle. So usually we take a, a, a big prime number and generate a list that long. And we make the backend successively choose buckets by order of preferences. So they, they say, oh, I prefer that bucket. And with a round robin, they choose the different buckets. And incoming flows are then consistently hashed to a bucket. And that bucket leads to the backend that shows it. The, the nice properties with that is that if we add a backend here, uh, backend three in red, uh, as backend one and two will still have the same preferred buckets, 
the number of flows that change backends will stay low because backends will mostly get their preferred buckets and uh, and so flows mostly won't change um, won't change locations here are, uh, actually i didn't draw any flow that changed but as i did draw drawing i choose the the best possible scenario so but but uh, it's the, the general idea so coming back to what this gives for a kubernetes cluster leveraging maglev um, this allows us to to directly use uh, ECMP for incoming flows. So we, we can have a stateless load balancing layer in front of the nodes that will change when the, the node changes. And when we take an incoming request to a service IP, going to a service IP, uh, it will reach a given node provided by ECMP. Here we, we, we take the node A. Uh, it will enter a VPP the way we saw earlier, and Maglev will load balance it to a pod. So maybe on the same node, maybe on, on another. Here it's node C. Uh, in the event uh, node disappear, so here on node A is gone, uh, it will remove itself from the ECMP pool, thus changing the load balancing decision for the flows. So all flow from the past figure will then reach a different node, but with the consistency properties of maglev, the load balancing decision will be the same, so the flow will still reach the node C. So for the pod serving the connection, things will be transparent, which won't be the case with a traditional load balancing. So there are a few things I hid a bit in this. So first, the set of backend changes as node A was running a, a pod with an Nginx logo. Um, but this shouldn't affect maglev as backend changes are mostly consistent. And also here, it's a reduction of the number of backends. So actually, the buckets will be spread a bit more, but existing flow won't be reshuffled. And second, for the return traffic, we have to enable direct service return DSR, because if we if we do the unnatting in the in the maglev, so if the return traffic follows the same path, that means we have to store state, and that we will lose the state uh, upon uh, node deletion. So we have to use that, but that's something we we also implemented in in Calico EVP. Similarly, the, the fact that uh, maglev is stateless also has nice properties in the event of a data plane restart. So this can happen if you want to upgrade your CNI or if VPP crashes, but, but we know this never happens for software, so that won't happen. But uh, in this case, you don't have to restore per flow state, so the load balancing decision will also stay consistent and the flow will still be load balanced to the, the same direction. And finally, the last thing about this is that as this is only an implementation detail, because Kubernetes does not say anything about the algorithm being used, this would work in combination with non-maglev nodes, provided that you don't uh, ECMP to them. And finally, for the last two cases, uh, we wanted to focus on our packet-oriented applications. So here we have the, the schematic showing the standard way of consuming packets in container um, that have the, the nice properties to of being transparent to, for the, to the application. Um, as we stated earlier, for, for endpoint application, this can prove performant enough, but with, can, with kernel uh, optimization such as GSO and Jiro. But when you start processing small packets, you, find you, you might find yourself limited by the network stack. And same thing with compute intensive L4, like TLS or Quick Crypto, or even TCP, kernel might be a bottleneck. So one way to address this is to change the way you consume uh, the interface within the container. You can attach the application to the container with AF packet, packet map, or AF XDP. That brings up a bit of uh, performance gains, but it's still marginal in terms of um, in terms of when building packet-oriented applications. As a side note, it's AF packet and AF XDP inside the pod, not for connecting VP to the uplink. Uh, both are possible, but uh, here it's inside the application. Uh, what we enable with a Calico VP, or want to enable because it's still work in progress, uh, is requesting an additional packet oriented interface in the container uh, with a simple annotation and, for example, the destination port and protocol you want to receive on it. And the application can then consume this uh, memory interface, this MAMIF, uh, directly in the pod, either by running another VPP inside the pod or by leveraging dpdk or libmemif directly from the application. 
So this enables full user space networking. So packets will never touch the, the kernel, the kernel on the path from the application to VPP. And containers can, can even leverage zero copy on the way from VPP to the application, not the other way around, because otherwise we would have to expose VPP memory to the application, which is not ideal from a security standpoint. The drawback being that uh, the application now has to be aware from libmamif uh, and, um, and uh, knowing how to connect to it. Same thing can, can apply to L4 protocol. We expose or want to expose the same mechanism. So VPP has support for TCP, UDP, TLS, DTLS, and QUIC. Uh, so, and, and that's uh, through the stack. So you, you just need the same way to, with an annotation to request support uh, in the pod. That will expose a socket-like API in, in, in the pod that you can consume leveraging uh, the VCL, which is a library that you can, a socket-like library that you, you can use in the application. This enables the same way um, full user space networking in, in Kubernetes, so no, no going through the kernel. Optionally, zero copy depending on your impl implementation. And that way, you can leverage VPP's optimized crypto or op optimized TCP. But again, with the drawback that you have to, to make your application VCL aware. So th that's, that's a bit of the, of the middle ground between uh, uh, getting better performance that you can get with the tuning interface, but the application should know that it runs uh, with, um, with optimized interfaces. To recap a bit the different ways of consuming traffic from within the container, in a, in a Calico VPP enabled canister, I, I summed here up the, the, the pros and cons. So for endpoint application, we don't have really definitive figures yet as, as, as this is still work in progress, but the, the performance uh, uh, gains are still quite substantial, uh, even more when it comes about crypto. Th there are a lot of numbers in CSIT, but that are not really Calico VPP numbers yet, but we, uh, we, uh, I should thank Florin for, for the, the work uh, on, on, this, uh, on those optimizations. And uh, concerning the packet-oriented interfaces, so the MAMIF, the order of magnitude of PPS that you can expect is around 10 million per core per queue. But again, this is, we're working on, on improving it. So we would need to do a bit more testing and, um, and um, an optimization to, to, to go there. But that's, uh, that's the, the, the thing we want to expose. And both have, have the same drawback of having to do some, some updates to the application. But I think that's the, the counterpart of uh, exposing higher performance. At some point, the offload has to be shared by the application. The knowledge of the offload has to be shared by the application. So that's it for this presentation. We, we have a number of new exciting feature, features on the horizon, including the, the maglev load balancing, the, the packet-oriented uh, interfaces, and uh, hopefully soon general availability in Calico. I, um, I, I hope we were gonna, we're gonna achieve that, uh, that soon. So if you'd like to, to stay up to date on the project, don't hesitate to join the, the VPP channel on the Calico Slack, the, the link is there. Uh, we publish our release there that, and, and, and follow the Calico releases. Uh, if you'd like to try it out, you can head over to the Calico documentation, which has the setup instructions. And if you have any questions at any point, don't hesitate to ping us on the Slack channel as well. We will we'll try to answer. But you can ask the the, the question right away. Uh, yeah, so we have. A few thanks a lot, already, actually, Nathan. Um, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Uh, I've answered a couple of questions that were that I knew the answer to, but we have several more in the Q and A. If you have a look with me. Um, okay. I, uh, I went straight ahead on the, on, on the presentation, so I, I didn't uh, Oh, that's okay. That much. Yeah, no, I, I picked out a couple anyway, but, um, but we, we have plenty of time now to run over them. Hmm. Right. Let me find my Zoom. q and I can read some out to you if that's yep. easier. Um, so the first question that came in is regarding fast AC, API support 200k updates per second. Which VPP data structure is updated at that rate? Is it classifier node? Um, so, from what I understand, so 
if I understand the, 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 the question correctly, it's how, how fast, uh, uh, sort of how fast VP can update its, um, uh, its data structure. So the way it works, VPP is connected to the agent via a binary API. Uh, on some APIs, it can go quite fast. Um, up to, up to um, I think, way more to 200k uh, requests per second. I think a million, if I recall correctly. But we, as we leverage uh, different, uh, so many API calls, that might get reduced in the case of fast Kubernetes uh, updates. Uh, we did actually do a bit of testing on the scaling part of when you want to create a lot of services. And from the testing, the main bottleneck was the was the etcd slash the Kubernetes logic being able to, to forward us the, the, the updates. So VPP is, is not the, the bottleneck yet, but we were definitely looking at optimizing this. And, uh, and then we, we upgrade, we update um, internal structures, data structures that are internal to VPP. So for that, the, the data plane will use them. Um, Great, thank you. Um, ne next question, is it possible to use this as secondary CNI via Multis? It is, it is definitely, we haven't tried it. Um, the, it, it, might, it might lead to some, to some quirks and some tricks to make it work properly because of the way we, we do swap the interface. Um, we, we sort of steal the interface from Linux and replace it with a fake one. So depending on the configuration that you have and uh, who, is the who is the chicken, who is the egg, uh, you might get into weird situations. But if you have different uplink interfaces, I think that won't, that won't be any problem. There are definitely ways to, to make it work. I think that's a, one where we'd really be interested in you joining us on Slack as well. Um, if you decide mm -hmm. to try to pursue that um, and share your experiences, and it may be that um, that we can help to unblock you. Yeah, no, definitely. Also, would be really interested in knowing the blockers, if there are any, on the, the, the thing we can do to improve that. OK, uh, another question. Uh, whether VPP batch processing model has an impact on latency? Any benchmarking done with service networking? Um, so batch processing, it has an impact, but it's very, very small. Uh, I, th there, there is a guy in your team who did some measurement with that, but on, on regular nodes, it's really under the microsecond level. So it's uh it from more testing it's barely noticeable from so the the fast path slow path going through the net and the, and the service logic will will be an order of magnitude slower than the, the the batching so so to explain a bit uh vpp has this concept of doing vectors of packets if i understand correctly uh, the question and processing them all at once so the first packet will be uh, so the, the first packet of the batch will be processed a bit slower than the, the last, but, uh, but that, that's usually really fast. And, and the, the other part of the question was about service networking. They don't, uh, was, oh, might have moved to answer. Uh, but we didn't do, um, oh, I actually, I actually marked it as answered. I think, uh, yeah, you'll find it in the answered section. I think you, I feel like you answered it really. Um, I, I think the only, the extra part was, was have we, spe have we specifically benchmarked uh, that service networking? So the service IPs. Um, so if, if by service networking, it's the, the, the NAT thing, we, we, we did a, a couple of benchmark uh, on that one. Uh, on throughput, it does not impact, and on PPS, uh, it starts to be a bit of a bottleneck at some point. But we are trying to to improve that. It, it, it plays a role in the in reducing the ten million packets per seconds on the MFS. 
So, but there are ongoing uh, in improvements. So on most benchmarking, we, we do an effort on benchmarking, but we also do an effort in improving the benchmark at the same time. Okay, uh, next question. Would it be possible to run a VPP-based NFB application in a pod with Calico's VPP data plane? In other words, VPP on top of VPP. Uh, definitely. Uh, that would work. So that, that that doesn't work in the latest release because we we still have to add to publish the, the support for that. But uh, so I mean that that would definitely work. Attaching VPP to a tap that would work better with added support from MNIST that we are going to, going to to release. But yeah, yeah there, there is definitely not nothing that uh, that prevents this from running. Um, maybe so this might bring some concerns on the addressing model and uh, because NFVs are not, Kubernetes is really made for dealing with endpoint applications in, in, in the space. So, so this might bring some questions and some things might be done better. So if, if the, 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 the person who asked this question, uh, he um, wants to, to join and, uh, and discuss with us, we'll be really interested to, to find the, the best way uh, to answer the, the things that might not be ideally answered by, by Kubernetes. But, but from a technical standpoint, yes. Okay, just a couple more questions. How does a packet processing workload interact with Calico BGP control plane? Surely it needs to advertise a subnet rather than a host route. Um, so, yeah, that, that, that starts diving into the how to do addressing uh, and um, with for packet processing uh, applications. We, we don't have yet a strong opinion on how to do this. Um, concerning the Calico BGP, we, we, don't, we didn't do any changes to it. So we just integrated it as, as it works with Linux. Um, so we could build something specific there um, that's dedicated to, to a networking application. But the, the way we thought about it for, um, for let's say, startup, startup packet processing applications would be to use NCAPs and to sort of bypass the Kubernetes networking at first. So you could you could think about uh, Kubernetes being just the scheduling, starting pods and uh, and giving them memory interfaces with addresses, and then on top of that you, you could uncap state packet and build your own uh, your own network, but you could also integrate with uh, the BGP and uh, but that would require a bit more specification. So it's still something we are thinking about. So happy to discuss also. Okay, um, and I and think we might just have one more question here. Okay. Does Calico make use of G Go VPP bindings for interacting with VPP? It does. It does. Uh, it does use Go VPP under the hood. Um, so yeah, we we use uh, we use this, and we have built a, a small small interaction layer between Go VPP and uh, an our integration to, to ease the updates when the API change and we, we play with specific features. But under the hood is that, yes. Okay, well, I think that covers all of our questions. So unless there's anything else, I think we can wrap just a couple minutes early. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to our presenters and we will see you on another episode of the LF Networking Webinar Series. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for everybody who joined and listened. Thanks a okay. lot for LF, LFN too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.